Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so glad you could be here. My name is Sarah Ewing, and I'm the Director of Adult Programs at the Jewish Community Center of the, Jace of the North Shore. And I want to thank you for joining us for this incredible opportunity to hear from expert Middle East intelligence analyst Avi Malamed. Malamed will present his program, Understanding the Current Conflict, a Pivotal Moment, and provide us with an update on the current situation in Israel and Gaza. I also want to thank our local partners for helping to get the word out and the Jewish Community Center Association for making this program possible. Also, I want to mention um, an interesting turn of events. Avi just met with the JCC's executive director, who is currently in Israel, and they met up in Sterot. So that was a nice turn of events that they got to get to know each other a little bit. Avi Malamud will speak for about an hour and then we'll answer questions from the audience. So please type your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and we will get to as many of your questions as possible. So just to underscore how fortunate we are to have Avi Malamud here today, I would like to share some highlights of his incredible career. Malamud is a former Israeli intelligence official and se senior Arab affairs advisor and founder of Inside the Middle East, an apolitical, nonpartisan educational nonprofit institute, and author of three books of, on the region. Malamud is also the author, producer, and host of The Seam Line, a newly released documentary series exploring the many layers of the conflict in and over Jerusalem. Malamud is fluent in Hebrew, Arabic, and English and a frequent con commentator on several international media platforms. He's recognized expert featured in Bloomberg, The Financial Times, The Hill, Newsweek, Reuters, and The Wall Street Journal, and is a permanent contributor to USA Today. I would like to thank Avi for taking the time out of his busy schedule to be with us today. And without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Avi Malamed. Hello. Sarah, shalom from Israel. Good evening. Thank you for your very kind uh, introduction. I hope that you can all hear me and uh, see me very uh, clearly. Indeed, today um, I met Mari uh, in the um, uh, tour in the road. It was a lovely, um, interesting uh, encounter. We spent a couple of hours in this area. As mentioned before, um, I'm going to talk about the situation today, the uh, war in Gaza Strip. Um, in shortly, I'm going to share with you um, a presentation that I will be using during my presentation tonight to explain the situation, uh, the current situation um, um, in different perspectives. I hope that you could see my uh, presentation. You could see in front of you uh, the schedule or the itinerary of my presentation. I will start with a short um, introduction talking about Gaza, some latest updates, how did we get here? Why did Hamas launch the war? I will talk about the issue. Are we heading towards a multi-front war? Uh, how the Arab world uh, views this whole situation? Some concluding notes and, as mentioned before, uh, Q&A concluding this uh, session. I will start with a short introduction uh, talking about Gaza Strip. You see in front of you the map. Uh, the map that you see in front of you shows both the state of Israel which is the dark brown that you see. It's a kind of like three-dimensional map. The, the bright areas that you see in front of you are actually uh, Palestinian territories. One is the West Bank that you could see to the right-hand side, also rather known as the Judea and Samaria or Palestinian territories. And then to the left-hand side at the bottom, you could see Gaza Strip, this narrow strip uh, located between Israel on the one hand and Egypt uh, on the other hand. Both the West Bank and Gaza Strip are not part of the state of Israel. The West Bank, uh, about 50% of the West Bank is ruled by the Palestinian Authority, and about 90% of the Palestinians in the West Bank are under the sovereignty or governance of the Palestinian Authority. Gaza Strip, with a population estimated of some 2 million people uh, to the left-hand side, is ruled by Hamas uh, since 2007. Here are some uh, milestones in the contemporary history of Gaza Strip uh, since the middle of the 20th century up until now. Between 1948 and 1967, Gaza Strip was ruled by Egypt. It was not annexed to Egypt, it was ruled by an Egyptian military governance. 
Following the Six Days War in 1967, Israel occupied Gaza Strip, and Israel ruled Gaza Strip until 2005. Like Egypt, Gaza, during the time of Israel's rule, Israel did not annex Gaza to Israel. However, during that period of time, Israeli governments established communities in Gaza Strip, rather known as settlements or Israeli communities. It depends who defines that. Some 21 settlements in Gaza Strip with a total population of some 10,000 Israeli citizens that lived in Gaza Strip. In 2005, Israeli government, led by uh, the late Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, decided to pull out from Gaza Strip under a law known by the name of the disengagement. In October 2005, Israel totally evacuated Gaza Strip. 21 settlements were dismantled. 10,000 Israeli citizens were evacuated from Gaza Strip and relocated uh, in Israel. And all the Israeli military forces that used to be in Gaza Strip also were evacuated from Gaza Strip. In parallel to that, Israel handed control over Gaza Strip to the hands of the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority was established as part of the Israeli PLO agreement in 1993, rather known as the Oslo Accords. So in October 2005, Israel is out of Gaza Strip. Palestinian Authority is in, taking control over the Gaza Strip. A year and a half later, in the summer of 2007, Hamas, a Palestinian Islamic movement that was born in Gaza Strip in the 1980s, conducted a military coup, terminating violently the rule of its own brothers, the Palestinian Authority in Gaza Strip. And since 2007 up until today, Hamas ruled Gaza Strip. Hamas, practically speaking, has been the government in Gaza Strip since 2007. Hamas had a Military personnel estimated at some 35,000 militants. There's police forces, it legislates laws, it sets the agenda at curriculum at schools and universities in Gaza Strip. It charges taxes and levies. And to make a long story short, Hamas, practically speaking, on the ground has been governing Gaza Strip since 2007. As you probably know, uh, October 7, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Palestine, the second largest military Palestinian organization in Gaza Strip, conducted a sudden attack on 28 Israeli communities in the vicinity of Gaza Strip. I'm sure that you are all familiar with that uh, day, October the 7th, and what happened during the day. Uh, more than 1,200 Israelis were killed, most of whom civilians. I'm sure that you are familiar with the atrocities conducted during that sudden attack, so I will not, of course, elaborate on that. As part of the attack, uh, more than 250 people, most of whom Israeli civilians, and some of them are foreign civilians, were also kidnapped to Gaza Strip by Hamas, by Islamic Jihad, and also by Gaza people, residents, if you wish, citizens who basically participated in the attack, and just roughly speaking to say grabbed, sort of speaking, Israeli citizens and took them with them back to Gaza Strip on October 7th. Talking about the issue of the hostages, as of today, there are still in captivity 136 um, um, uh, hostages held in Gaza Strip, most of whom are Israeli citizens, including women, uh, kids, babies, um, senior citizens. Um, as you could see in this chart, um, 110 uh, hostages were released alive. Unfortunately, another seven that were released were dead. It is estimated right now formally that there are at least 14 uh, hostages that died in captivity. Apparently, it is seems to be like that the number of hostages, uh, unfortunately, that died in the captivity or because they were killed or because the lack of treatment has been larger than that. We don't have valid information vis-a-vis -vis that specific issue. Following the attack of uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad on Israel on October 7th, Israeli governments ordered the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, to 
launched um, a military ground operation against Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza Strip. The objectives that were set to the Israeli Defense Forces were to try to release the hostages, to eliminate Hamas military capacities, and to end Hamas rule in Gaza Strip. A couple of weeks after October 7th, once Israel completed its preparedness uh, to the ground operation, Israel started a massive ground operation in Gaza Strip. The first phase of this ground operation was in the northern part of Gaza Strip, and you could see that area right in front of you, particularly focusing on the area of Gaza City. Gaza City is the major urban area in Gaza. Roughly speaking, it is estimated that up until the war, some half of the population of Gaza, almost one million people, lived in the area of Gaza Strip and its vicinity. Gaza Strip is also the stronghold of Hamas governmental and military presence in Gaza Strip. Headquarters, bunkers, offices, governmental offices of Hamas located in Gaza Strip, in the area of Gaza Strip and its vicinity. The IDF launched this massive ground operation a couple of weeks after October 7th, and as part of this massive ground operation, one of the things that, of course, the IDF has to take into consideration all the time is the fact that this is a warfare which is very complicated because it's taking place in a massively populated area. As I mentioned before, there are some 2 million Palestinians living in Gaza Strip. So it's a war that is not taking place in a remote desert or in a, a remote mountains. It's taking place in a massively populated urban. On top of that, we have to take into consideration that the Hamas and Islamic Jihad is part of their military tactic are basically operating and they are entrenched deliberately and knowingly within the civil population of Gaza Strip. You probably saw the evidence of the massive network of tunnels and bunkers that were digged by Hamas beneath schools, hospitals, mosques, commercial centers, residential areas. And this is part of the tactic that has been deployed by Hamas and Islamic Jihad as part of their military a modus operandi. That, of course, obviously makes the fighting within this massively populated area much more challenging uh, already. As part of the attempts of Israel to try and to the best way possible um, minimize uh, collateral damage, one of the first things that Israel was doing parallel to the ground operation was to create a safe land corridor for the people of Gaza Strip in the northern part of Gaza Strip to move down to the southern part of Gaza Strip. You could see this blue purples that indicates this, um, this land corridor that was established by the Israeli Defense Forces to enable Gaza civilian citizens who are not involved in the fight to move down to the area of uh, South Gaza. And you could see in front of you on this map, very close to the Gaza-Egypt border, could see this white square, a place called Mawasi, that has become some sort of like safe zone for Palestinian civilians who are making their way down from the northern and southern part of Gaza Strip towards this area. In the weeks following uh, the Israeli operation on the ground in Gaza Strip, uh, the IDF announced recently that he was successfully dismantling 12 battalions of Hamas as well as forces of Islamic Jihad located in the northern part of Gaza Strip. The names that you see in front of you basically are representing different areas in the northern part of Gaza Strip, and each and every one of them also represents the Hamas battalion that was located in those areas. As the war intensified and the land operation intensified in Gaza Strip, um, moving more and more towards the center and the southern part of Gaza Strip, you could see right in front of you this major area called Khan Yunis. Khan Yunis is actually the birthplace of Hamas. This is where Hamas basically started its way back in the 1980s in Gaza Strip. Khan Yunis area is considered to be the second largest um, urban area in Gaza Strip after Gaza City. Khan Yunis is very interesting in the sense because it's a combination of both residential area um, refugee camps and rural areas. By the way, when I'm saying refugee camps, and you may envision tin uh, cans or tents, that is not the picture. Actually, we are talking about massively built residential area, even though in comparison to Gaza City, you don't see much 
of high buildings, so of speaking, in the area of Khan Yunus. Uh, but this is the interesting mixture or, or combination of the whole area of Khan Yunis. One other interesting uh, reason for the significance of Khan Yunis is that it is estimated that the major Hamas leaders uh, involved in the attack of October 7th, as well as the hostages, are being kept in a massive underground tunnels uh, beneath the area of Khan Yunis. In that regard, uh, today, uh, According to report of the New York Times, citing Israeli um, officials, uh, the massive tunnels in Gaza Strip is basically astonishing in its size. We are looking at something like around 500 miles of tunnels that were dug uh, by Hamas um, during the years it controlled Gaza Strip since 2007. Those tunnels, as I mentioned before, are basically uh, serving Hamas people, Hamas militants. The purpose of the tunnels is to enable Hamas militants to move safely under the ground, trying to avoid the Israeli attacks. They are enabling Hamas to coordinate and to continue the fight as they are under the ground, and also enable Hamas militants to emerge from different uh, entrances and, and, and exits of the tunnels. By the way, recent um, um, recent data on that regard indicates that there has been thousands of entrances and exits of those tunnels. Some of those entrances and exits are located in private apartments, in hospitals, in mosques, in schools, and so on and so on. The circles that you see in front of you, the blue circles indicates areas in Khan Yunis where right now there is a fierce fighting going on between Israeli Defense Forces and Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The white areas are areas that, roughly speaking, Israel has mostly completed its military mission on the ground. The green areas that you see to the right-hand side indicates areas that still um, are supposed to be addressed by the Israeli Defense Forces as the part of the upcoming military, uh, military phase. Again, talking about the whole issue of the humanitarian crisis and the need to minimize as much as possible collateral damage, as the war evolved more and more towards the center and southern part of Gaza Strip, Israel further established two major paths uh, for civilians to walk down safely from the center and the northern part of Gaza Strip to the southern part of Gaza Strip. You could see in this map in front of you that the northern part of Gaza Strip there used to be an old corridor. That old corridor was now blocked by Israel, and now there is an alternative corridor that basically connects the center part of Gaza Strip with the southern part. Parallel to that, Israel also um, uh, facilitates the western part of Gaza Strip. You could see that um, yellow line indicating what is called the Sea Road Corridor. This is one of the major road corridors today Israel enables Palestinians to use that corridor to make their way down from the north to the south part of Gaza Strip. Up until now, as for the moment, Israel prevents the return of Palestinians from the south to the north of Gaza Strip for two major reasons. One, there is still fierce fight going on in some of those areas in the north and the center. And second, uh, many buildings have been demolished during the fight, so actually the citizens or civilians who want to go back actually have nothing back to go to. And so they still have to be located in the south part of Gaza Strip, the area of Mawasi that I mentioned before. That map uh, shows something interesting about the way Israel is trying to um, uh, minimize as much as possible collateral damage. You could see that this map is actually divided to blocks and the blocks are numbered. The idea beyond that is that Israel has divided uh, those areas and actually um, distributed that map that you see in front of you, both as a digital version as well as a printed version. Uh, Israel divide, uh, uh, provided that map to the citizens, the civilians in Gaza Strip. And the idea is actually to give warning, to warn people in Gaza Strip to evacuate specific areas. So, for example, if you live in blocks 65 and 74 or 28, you are being given a notice in advance, a couple of hours in advance, to evacuate the area where you live because it's going to become a war zone. This is yet another mean that Israel is trying to apply on the ground 
in order to try and to minimize as much as possible um, collateral damage. If you look at the map towards the Mediterranean Sea, you could see once again circled in this um, orange line, you could see Al Mawasi, the humanitarian zone that I mentioned before. Parallel to that, there, are, uh, there is a stream of convoys of um, humanitarian aid making its way to Gaza Strip from both the Gaza-Egypt border that you see uh, on this uh, map. This is the Rafah crossing. And also at the same time from the northern part, from the Gaza-Israel border to the Erez crossing. Now, these uh, convoys are basically providing commodities, fuel, uh, medical equipment, and so on for the people of Gaza Strip again, trying as much as possible to, um, to alleviate as much as possible the suffering of the people and to try and to much as possible minimize um, conditions of humanitarian crisis um, in, in Gaza Strip. This was a kind of like a latest updates regarding the story of the issue of the hostages and the situation in Gaza Strip. And now let us move to ask, how did we get here? I would say that um, I think it's important to understand that this war actually didn't start in October 7th. We are actually looking at a situation or a point of time where we see a conjunction of two major processes that took place in the Middle East for the last couple of decades. Those two processes, on which I'm going to elaborate a little bit soon, actually resulted in this point of time, this conjunction that uh, results in, in the end of the day, the um, the war that we're right now involved in. One process is the uh, inner Palestinian power struggle over leadership. The other process is Iran's hegemonic vision. Let me start saying a few words about the inner Palestinian power struggle over leadership. There are two major Palestinian players, sort of speaking. One is Hamas that was established in the 1980s in Gaza Strip. The other one is Fatah, that was established in the 1950s in uh, the Gulf uh, Arab states. They are coming from two different um, ideologies, political camp, um, and they have totally different perspective vis-a-vis -vis the question of uh, the issue of uh, national statehood. Here is some context in that, in that regard. You know, um, in the 20th century, the people of the Middle East were first introduced to the concept that is called national statehood. Up until then, this was totally an alien concept to the people of the Middle East. And from very early days, the whole issue of national statehood involved an ongoing political, ideological, cultural debate within the Muslim and the Arab world. As for example, a large camp in the Muslim and the Arab world, the Islamic camp, totally reject the concept of national statehood. They argue that this is a Christian Western concept. They argue that basically basing legislation upon parliamentary process is countering the rule of Islamic religious law, uh, the religious codex rather is known by the name of Sharia law. And Islamic camp actually said that their envision not an independent national statehood structure, but rather one big global entity guided by the Islamic mindset and Islamic religious codex, the Sharia law. And that entity is rather known also by the name of caliphate, which could be translated, if you wish, as kingdom. The most well-known representative of that outlook is what is going to become the biggest mass movement in the Muslim Sunni world, the Muslim Brotherhood movement that was established in the 1920s in Egypt. 60 years later, in Gaza Strip, Hamas is going to appear on the map, and Hamas formally defined itself as the offspring of the Muslim Brotherhood. So you can understand from that that Hamas ideologically actually rejects the concept of an independent state, national state, but rather endorses the concept of caliphate. There is some irony in that because, as you probably know today, for example, in some circles in the West, uh, a slogan that has become very common is the slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The people who are chanting that uh, slogan think that they are basically 
echoing Hamas ideological objective. That is inaccurate. That is a mistake because Hamas in the end of the day doesn't want to have an independent Palestinian state. Hamas basically ideologically says once the state of Israel is to be eliminated, the Palestinian state will be only a transition point, a station, if you wish, towards the final objective, which is the creating of a global caliphate. As part of its ideology, and it's part of the ideology of its mother movement, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas vows to eliminate the state of Israel. Hamas is not interested in compromising, he is not interested in any kind of peaceful solution. Hamas clearly, openly this state that his objective is to eliminate the state of Israel through the use of violence. Fatah organization, which actually appeared on the stage of history before Hamas, already back in the late 50s in the Gulf states, is coming from the camp of the national state uh, supporters. Differently from Hamas, the Fatah rejects the concept of caliphate. Differently from Hamas, Fatah says that the source of legislation should be a parliamentary-based process, not the Islamic religious codex. And once the PLO signed the Oslo Agreement with Israel, Fatah is the major spine of the PLO. By signing that agreement, the Fatah basically recognized Israel's right to exist. So you could see right there that there are some very major significant differences between these two entities, and they have been fighting for influence and leadership of the Palestinian people for more than four decades. That power struggle intensified and escalated in the last couple of decades, and particularly following the takeover of uh, Gaza Strip by Hamas in 2007, reminding you that Hamas in 2007 forcefully eliminated the rule of the Palestinian Authority. Fatah is the major spine of the Palestinian Authority. In the clashes between Hamas and Fatah back in the summer of 2007, hundreds of uh, Fatah people were killed by Hamas, and following that violent takeover of Gaza Strip, basically what happened on the ground was that the power struggle between the two Palestinian major players intensified dramatically. All the attempts of Arab leaders to reconcile uh, the parts basically failed. So we are looking at an enormous inner Palestinian power struggle over leadership, over ideology and political perspective and outlook uh, that are totally different one from the other. And this is a battle to death or life because none of these players basically is willing to give the other one the space to become partner in dictating or, or deciding what should be the trajectory of the people, the Palestinian people, and what should be the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So in that regard, we are looking at a very bitter power struggle between the two factors, between Hamas and the Fatah organization. So this is one major process. The other one has to do with another significant development that took in the Middle East, and this is the rise to power of the Mullah regime in Iran. In 1979, there is an Islamic revolution in Iran. Iran becomes a Shiite theocracy under the leadership of what is going to be known by the name of the Mullah regime. Again, let me put it in a little bit, some kind of like a historic and, and wide context so we can understand the full scale of that development. Majority of the Muslims in the world are Sunnis about 85%. Minority of the Muslims in the world are known as Shiite. Shiite is a word in Arabic which means a political faction. Both are Muslims. However, there is a bitter animosity and rivalry between these two camps within Islam. That rivalry goes across 1400 years when the two camps have basically been competing over influence, power, and leadership of the Muslim world. The Shiites view themselves as the authentic 
leaders of the Muslim world. They view themselves as those who have been deprived of the right to lead the Muslim world, and they accuse the Sunni Muslims in stealing, quote unquote, the crown of leadership from the Shiites. In course of time, uh, the rivalry between the two camps uh, just became more and more bitter, as they are totally different one from the other in the way they look at um, narratives, at um, theological um, uh, doctrines, obviously the whole issue of the crown of leadership. And so for the last 1400 years, Sunnis and Shiites have been basically butchering each other. They are both Muslims, but the animosity between the two camps is non bridgeable. Another significant uh, story in that regard is the story of the power struggle between three major Muslim civilizations in the Middle East. One is the Arab civilization. Islam was born in the Arab civilization and majority of the Arabs are Sunnis. Another civilization is the Persian civilization, Iran of our times. The Persian civilization is predominantly Shiite. And the third civilization is the Turkish civilization. The Turks, most of them, are Sunnis. So you got three major civilizations, Muslim civilization. You got Arab civilization, which, which is predominantly Sunni, Persian civilization, predominantly Shiite, and Turkish civilization, predominate Sunni as well. And they are competing for power and influence through history. So these are two major axes of struggle, power struggle, Sunnis versus Shiites in Islam, and Arab versus Persians versus Turks uh, in the region. So when the Mullah regime comes to power in Iran in 1979, what is known as the Islamic Revolution, and Iran becomes a Shiite theocracy, one of the major features of that regime is the fact that this regime is inspired uh, uh, by a very revolutionary outlook of mankind and the trajectory of mankind, and more, not less significant, by a very apocalyptic outlook of the history and trajectory of mankind. And as part of its um, feeling of revenge, if we can use this term, because the Shiite views themselves as the one that have been deprived of the right to lead the Muslim world. The Mullah regime in Tehran is basically uh, proactively advancing a very aggressive, aggressive expansion policy across the Middle East under the title of exporting the Islamic revolution. In the mindset of the Mullah regime, exporting the Islamic revolution has a couple of objectives. One is to position Iran as the superpower of the region. The other one, not less significant, is actually to, by doing that, according to the Mullah regime, they are basically undoing the unjust, allegedly, according to the Shiite narrative, they are undoing the unjust that caused to the Shiites back in the 7th century, 1400 years ago, when, again, according to the Shiite narrative, the crown of leadership was stolen from them by the Sunni Arabs. So motivated by this deep narrative, the Mullah regime has been uh, leading and advancing a very uh, proactive, aggressive expansion policy across the Middle East, rather known by the name of the Shiite Crescent. This is a term that was basically made by the Jordanian king, the current king, Abdullah II, already back in 2004, when he was alarming with the situation or with the possible scenario of Iranian Crescent that will be created across the Middle East, and it will be particularly at the expense of the Arab Sunni world itself. His warning was very well based. When we look today, a uh, couple of decades after this regime came to power, we could see that this regime was quite successfully extending its influence across the Middle East. The method or the platform that the Mullah regime has been quite successfully and effectively using to that end was to position itself as the spearhead of what is known as the camp of the resistance. 
The concept of the resistance is very central in the Middle East terminology. It is basically an ideology that has some very significant features like total rejection of Western values, vowing to eliminate and end Western presence in the Middle East, the unrelenting struggle against Israel until it's annihilated and destroyed, and also the concept of liberating Palestine. The Mullah regime positioned itself as the spearhead of that camp, knowing that that uh, slogans, that, that image, will basically provide the Mullah regime with credibility in the Arab Sunni world, reminding you the Arab Sunni world is quite suspicious when we are talking about the Mullah regime. After all, this is a Shiite Persian regime. And indeed, to a large extent, the Mullah regime was very effectively and sophisticatedly um, exploiting that, that concept of the resistance in order to try and to build this massive network of um, the Shiite crescent that I mentioned before. Another major uh, mechanism that enabled the Mullah regime to uh, advance its program was the creation of a triangular mutual deterrence strategy which has three major components. One, it's its new clear program. The other is its very advanced and sophisticated missiles and drones industry. And the third one is the creation of network of local proxies, armies of terror, if you wish, that the Mullah regime was successfully deploying, creating and deploying across the Middle East. When we are talking about this network of armies of terror that the Mullah regime has deployed across the Middle East, which rather known also by the name of the Axis of Resistance, you could see how those armies of terror scattered from Gaza Strip, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, all the way down to Yemen, the lower part of this map. This network of armies of terror has become one of the most powerful tools in the service of the Iranian vision of the Shiite crescent. There is something very interesting about those armies of terror. Almost all of them are based upon Shiites. None of them is based upon Iranians. They are based upon Arabs. So for example, in an Arab state called Lebanon, bordering Israel from the north, the Mullah regime established in the 1980s what is going to become its most powerful proxy, an organization called Hezbollah, the party of God. This is the meaning of the name. In Syria, you could find today Iraqi Shiite militias, Afghan Shiite militias, Pakistani Shiite militias, who are all backed, supported, armed, and instructed by the Mullah regime. None of them are Iranians. In Yemen, a name that became recently in the center of the news, the Houthis in Yemen. The Houthis are Shiite tribes in Yemen. They are about 35% of the Yemenite population and they are mostly located in the northern part of Yemen. So you could see that the Mullah regime was very successfully deploying these armies of terror, not based on Iranians, but rather based on Arabs, because their major component of identity is not their ethnical identity, meaning being Arabs, neither the fact that they are Lebanese or Syrians or Iraqis or Yemenites. No, for them, the major component of identity is the fact that they are Shiites. And thus, they identify and subdue to the Mullah regime in Tehran because they view them as the higher source of Shiite orthodoxy. When you look at the map in front of you, you could see there is one figure that is colored yellow in this structure of armies of terror. And it is located in Gaza Strip. That yellow figure represents Hamas, Islamic Jihad, as well as some other small scale uh, Palestinian organizations that are part of this axis of resistance backed by the Iranians. It is colored in yellow because Hamas and Islamic Jihad, like 99% of the Palestinians, 
they are not Shiites, they are Sunnis. <clears throat> so you may wonder, of course, what brings then Palestinians, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad, who are Sunnis, what brings them to join hands with the rest of the axis of resistance, who is predominantly Shiite? The answer, of course, is that they all vote to eliminate the state of Israel. In other words, <clears throat> we are looking here at a conjunction, or I would say marriage of convenience, between Hamas and Islamic Jihad, who votes to eliminate Israel through the use of power, and the Iranian regime, who wants to further fuel the conflict of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, because by fueling the conflict, the Mullah regime could continue and market itself to the Arab world as allegedly the defender of the Palestinian and as allegedly the spearhead of the camp that will liberate Palestine. The irony and the bitter truth is that the Mullah regime couldn't care less about the Palestinians. It is the same regime that has been butchering thousands of Palestinians in Syria during the war in Syria. However, this is the significance of the structure that the Mullah regime has been building. As part of this axis of resistance that the Mullah regime was building, there is another significant sub-segment, if I would say, to this Iranian structure, and this is the master plan that is called the Ring of Fire. The Iranian master plan of Ring of Fire basically designed and designated to end, through the use of violence, the state of Israel, to terminate the state of Israel through the use of conventional weapons, not non-conventional. And the concept of the Ring of Fire is basically based upon the basis of power and influence that the Mullah regime was able to create itself in Lebanon in the shape of Hezbollah, in Syria in the shape of Iraqi, Afghan, Pakistani militias, in Gaza Strip in the shape of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And that Ring of Fire is basically some very interesting segments. <clears throat> One major objective of the Ring of Fire is actually to exhaust Israel through repeating military rounds. In that regards, the most significant role is of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Their major task in the large scheme of the Ring of Fire, <clears throat> their major task is to be the one who constantly perpetuate the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And indeed, when you look at the situation and the story of Gaza Strip and Israel, particularly in the last 20 years since Hamas took over Gaza Strip, you could see very clearly that the military round between Israel and Hamas has been repeating itself, and each and every one of these rounds was more violent than the one before. It is not by chance. It is part of this tactic of eroding, if you wish, exhausting Israel through this military round. And one of the major features of that tactic is that the exhaustion of Israel is done through deliberately, knowingly targeting its soft belly, which are the civilians. That is the reason that for the last 20 years or so, we saw that the major attacks on Israel basically were targeting civilians, either the phenomenon of Palestinian suicide bombers, a phenomenon that was totally led by Hamas and Islamic Jihad, or in the last couple of decades through the phenomenon of rocket shooting, dozens of thousands of rockets shot from Gaza Strip targeting Israeli civilians, Israeli cities, infrastructure, and so on and so on. It is not by chance. It is part of this tactic that in the end of the day is supposed to erode and exhaust Israel. Another interesting feature of this ring of fire uh, uh, tactic was the concept of creating enough military uh, strength backed by the Iranians around Israel's neck, meaning in Hezbollah and Lebanon, uh, Iraqi, Afghan, Pakistani, as well as Hezbollah uh, factors also in Syria, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The concept was to build and is to build this massive military might around Israel's neck. And then when the time comes, 
all this massive ring of fire should be simultaneously activated, attacking Israel from all directions, from Lebanon, from Syria, from Gaza Strip. October 7 attack of Hamas and Islamic Jihad on Israel was actually a manifestation or partial manifestation of that concept, because as we'll shortly see, the other arenas did not really, at least up until now, did not fully join the Hamas and Islamic Jihad attack of October 7. And this concept is known by the name of unifying of the arenas. And that brings us to the question, why did Hamas launch the war? A couple of explanations to that. I would say one of them has to do with what we already talked about, and this is the power struggle between Hamas and Fatah over leadership. Hamas views itself as a regional player. Hamas wants to be the one and only Palestinian factor who dictate the faith of the Palestinian people, as well as the trajectory of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Another reason is the story of normalization. In the last couple of years, as you probably know, there has been a process of normalization between Israel and Arab states. That process resulted in a growing concern and resentment within the Palestinians who felt that their brothers, the Arabs, are deserting them. Those sentiments have further boosted against the background of reports about Saudi-Israeli rapprochement. Uh, that resulted in a growing panic within the Palestinians who basically said, well, if the Saudis are now going to sign an agreement with sign an agreement with Israel, that means that basically our all issue, our all case is totally thrown under the bus. It is very possible then that one of the reasons Hamas launched that war was that it was hoping to that to basically block the process of Israeli Saudi rapprochement. Also in that regard we should notice that it's also in Iranian interest to block a Saudi-Israeli rapprochement. So here you got a conjunction of interest, again, between Hamas and the Mullah regime in Tehran. It is possible that another reason that fuels Hamas' decision was that he was convinced, Hamas was convinced, that the time for the unifying of the arenas has come, uh, given to the major political crisis Israel has been going through the last year. There has been some growing impression within the camps of the Iranian-backed militias that Israel is at the brink of collapsing, and maybe that is the right time to launch this um, massive attack on Israel in the frame of unifying the arenas. So apparently these were the major, I would say, uh, reasons that fuels Hamas' decision to attack Israel on October 7. Obviously, that attack, as we all understand, was uh, planned uh, for many years, and uh, that was the time Hamas decided it's the time to carry out that attack. In fact, there has been meetings of the leaders of the axis of resistance, the Iraqi Shiite milita militias leaders, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah leaders, the Iranian revolutionary, the Islamic Iranian revolutionary guards, commanders. Those meetings took place in Beirut, in Baghdad, in Iran before October 7, and basically they were supposed to coordinate the concept of or the execution of the unifying of the arenas. It seems like Hamas and Islamic Jihad uh, final decision to launch that war was also fueled uh, by the understanding or the impression that the time has come for unifying the arenas. But what happened on the ground uh, in that regard? And that brings us to the questions, are we heading towards a multi-front war? In other words, are we heading a situation of the unifying of the arenas that I was talking about? And one of the interesting things that we noticed since day one of the war was that Iran applies a very interesting tactic vis-a-vis -vis this war, basically reflecting an Iranian dilemma. Now that we understand the significance of Hamas and Islamic Jihad in the context of the Iranian master plan, the Ring of Fire, 
we understand that the downfall of Hamas war in Gaza Strip is a bad news for the Iranian regime. It actually, uh, you know, pull out the rug beneath the Iranian feet, because if Hamas rule in Gaza Strip comes to an end and there is no perpetuation and escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Hamas uh, Iranian regime will be find it more and more challenging to continue and to market itself to the Arab world as the defender of the Palestinians. But then on the other hand, if the Iranian regime wants to try to save Hamas from the Israeli military move, it has to send into the war its most powerful proxy, the Hezbollah in Lebanon. But then by doing that, there has been some very significant reasons for self-restraint as far as the Iranian, the Hezbollah are concerned. One is the concern that Israel's might, military might, will damage severely Hezbollah's capacities. Another reason for that is the fact that the Biden administration and President Biden sent a very strong message to the Iranians and the Hezbollah since day one of the war, basically saying one word, don't. And backing that with a massive deployment of U.S. military power in the eastern basin of the Middle East and other parts of the area. Another reason for the lack of enthusiasm of Hezbollah and the Iranians to to be massively involved in full scale in the war is the situation in Lebanon. Lebanon is a crumbling state. Um, the Lebanese are petrified with the possibility that Hezbollah will drag them to a war uh, because they all understand that that war basically meaning the final funeral of Lebanon. This is a situation which very likely is going to be encompassed with a civil war in Lebanon. The Hezbollah thus will have to divert its attention to the situation inside Lebanon. So these are a couple of major calculations that in the end of the day dictated an Iranian tactic, which is very interesting. And the policy, the tactic that was applied and is still applied by the Iranian regime is actually to conduct a very well calculated escalation in a small steps, relatively speaking, not in a very dramatic perspectives. And those attacks are carried out either simultaneously or in different timing by the different proxies of the Mullah regime across the Middle East. So, for example, we see the ongoing skirmish between Israel and the Hezbollah along the Israeli-Lebanese border. This is one example. That skirmish that has been taking place since day one of this war is mostly confined within a very specific zone along the Israeli-Lebanese border and it's kind of like exists in what I call the twilight zone, meaning it is between the orange line and the red line. Sometimes it's getting a little bit closer to the red lines. Sometimes it's getting closer to the red to the orange line, but still it is relatively speaking confined, and relatively speaking in a low intensity. Um, similar to that, we saw more than 140 attacks of Iraqi Shiite militias targeting U.S. military presence in the northern part of Iraq as well as in Syria. Again, those attacks are, relatively speaking, small intensity, uh, like drones or here and there shooting rockets, uh, in most of the cases ending up with no severe um, human damages. Many were injured, but no fatalities have been reported, to the best of my knowledge, up until now on the U.S. side. Another interesting arena is the Yemenite arena, the Houthis. And to be more um, accurate talking about the story of the Houthis, we are talking about a very clear escalation that took place in a very significant arena. And this is the region of the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandab Strait. When you look at the map in front of you, you could see Yemen, and you could see how strategically it's located because it sits on one of the most strategic passages, naval uh, water uh, road passages in the world, which is the Bab el Mandab Strait, connecting the Red Sea that you see in front of you with the Indian Ocean. Some 40% of the global trade of Europe is going through this major naval passage, meaning the Red Sea is connecting to the eastern basin of the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal. And then going all the way down to the Indian Ocean. So you can understand it's an enormously significant passage. In the last couple of weeks, since the very early stage of this war, 
the Houthis in Yemen announced war on Israel. At first, they started shooting directly at Israel, shooting missiles, shooting cruise missiles, shooting drones. All of those weapons, of course, are provided to the Houthis by the Iranians. The attacks on Israel were intercepted, either by Israel or the U.S. military presence in the Red Sea or by the Saudis. In the last couple of weeks, the Houthis escalated the um, aggression in this region and started to attack uh, maritime trade ships that are crossing in the Red Sea, resulting in an enormous burden on the world economy because major um, uh, shipping companies, like, for example, Myers, basically had to redirect the route of the ships, basically going all the way around Africa. That has an enormous consequences because then you are talking about higher fees of insurance. You are talking about longer time of providing commodities. You are talking about interrupting the process of um, um, uh, manufacturing. All in all, when you look at all that, there is an enormous significant um, accumulating impact on the, on the, on the global trade. As the Houthis' attacks on the Red Sea intensified, the Houthis argued that they will continue those attacks until there will be a ceasefire in Gaza Strip. They basically once again play the Palestinian card, presenting themselves allegedly as the protectors of the Palestinians. The Houthis couldn't care less about the Palestinians. Yemen and the Houthis are more than 1,000 miles away from Gaza Strip. The Houthis has been engaging in war in Yemen since they conducted a military coup in Yemen in September 2014. We are talking about a local Yemenite power that in the end of the day doesn't really have to do anything with the Palestinians or the Palestinian issue or Gaza Strip. However, being part of the Iranian structure, the Houthis basically are playing the card of allegedly defend, defending the Palestinians and saving Gaza Strip. Against the background of these increasing Houthis attacks, the United States assembled a coalition under the name of the Guardians of Prosperity. And that coalition that has a military presence in the Red Sea, the Bab el Mandab Strait, basically is trying to thwart and block the expansion of Houthis uh, violence in this region. In the last couple of days, there has been another yet escalation where following the Houthis attacks and their refusal to um, to comply with the international demand, including one that was set by the United Nations Security Council, the United States-led coalition initiated a proactively military strike at some of the Houthis' deposits of weapons uh, in, in Yemen. The most recent development yesterday, there has been another attack of the Houthis, this time targeting an American-owned ship, not a military one, civil one. And that, following that, there has been yet again, a couple of hours ago, another US-led retaliation against the Houthis in this area. So we are definitely looking at a scenario on an area that right now is drawing the attention uh, because the ramification of the development in the Red Sea, the Bab el-Mandab Strait, as you can understand, are not only regional, they are also exceeding the regional uh, level. One other thing that I want to refer to is the issue of the Arab world and the war. And it's very interesting because, again, in a way, ironically speaking, uh, while some circles in the West have been constantly exempting, so sort of speaking, the Hamas from responsibility for the situation in Gaza Strip, um, in the Arab world, there has been an ongoing and mounting criticism on Hamas, and not from the not only following October seventh, way before October seventh. In fact, since Hamas took over Gaza Strip in two thousand and seven, and dragged Gaza Strip into um, a dead end street uh, because of its um, violent ideology and because of the repeating military round with Israel. There has been a mounting criticism in the Arab world on Hamas. One of the major uh, focal areas of this criticism is not only the fact that under Hamas rule, Gaza Strip indeed was time and time again dragged to this dead end street, uh, but also the fact that the Arab world is furious with the fact that Hamas is actually 
acting uh, in the service of the Mullah regime in Tehran at the expense of the people of Kazakhstan. Um, um, so you could see in front of you uh, to the left-hand side to the bottom one of the many cartoons that you could find in the Arab world. And that cartoon shows you uh, the puppet here, which is the Iranian uh, leader, Ali Khamenei, spiritual supreme leader of the Mullah regime, Ali Khamenei. He is the puppeteer, he is holding two puppets. Uh, one of them says in Arabic, Hamas. The other one says Islamic Jihad. And beneath you see this urban area and the script in Arabic reads Gaza Strip. The message, of course, is clear. You, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, you are puppets. Uh, and the puppeteer are the Iranians. And they are using you at the expense of your own brothers and sisters in Gaza Strip. Following the war and the, uh, the the havoc and the destruction caused in Gaza Strip, um, you could understand that the criticism in the Arab world on Hamas has been further mounting. Um, and one of the major focal points of this criticism has to do with the story that we talked about, the uni unifying of the arenas. You may remember we talked about this whole concept where allegedly Together as one in, in an orchestrated move simultaneously to attack Israel from different directions, and that didn't happen uh, the way it was viewed by Hamas on October 7th. And, and that results in a lot of criticism in the Arab world as well. And you could see this uh, cartoon to the right hand side um, that has two parts. You could see to the left hand side, the Mullah regime is giving the signal, uh, you know, launching the runners to the way. And so you see that the white figure representing Hamas and Islamic Jihad is set off to its course. It is heading towards the fighting against Israel. You could see the arrow that signal Israel. You could see the Star of David um, above that figure. But you could also notice that the black figure remain in its place and it is attached to the Mullah regime. The black figure actually represents the other elements of the axis of resistance the Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Iraqi Shiite militias, the Pakistani Shiite militias. And so the message beyond this cartoon, again, reflecting the criticism on the Arab world, saying to Hamas and Islamic Jihad, you were misled by the Iranian regime and the story of unifying the arenas. And you were fooled by the Iranian regime. And you dragged Gaza Strip to havoc and destruction and death because you thought that the time now come for unifying the arenas. But your calculations and your priorities are not the Iranian regime's ones. They have a different priorities. They have a different calculations. And the Iranian regime couldn't care less about your brothers and sisters in Gaza Strip. If the Iranian regime, as it happens up until now, decided that it's not going to join in, that's the result. You are finding yourself alone, facing in the end of the day, the rage and might of Israel and the people of Gaza Strip, your own brothers and sisters are paying dearly for that. Some concluding notes. Um, let's be clear about trying to set the objectives on from the Israeli perspective of that of that war. Hamas is not going to disappear. I know that there's some people that basically talk about it in the context of like, you know, eliminating Hamas or it is totally irrelevant. Hamas is not going to disappear. Hamas is, as you can understand, is, is rooted deeply in, in the heart and minds of many people, Palestinians and non-Palestinians. It has an ideological roots. We talked about the Muslim Brotherhood. It has uh, its own radical agenda, um, its military might, its political capacity. So Hamas is not going to disappear. So the idea here is not to eliminate Hamas. The idea is actually to make Hamas irrelevant. Until October 6th, Hamas viewed itself and was acting as not only a domestic player, but also as a regional player, and to a large extent, rightfully so. Um, in the sense that Hamas basically was viewing himself as one that could dictate the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as it did. So the whole idea or the whole purpose of the objective is to actually make Hamas irrelevant player in the sense that it will not be able to continue 
and to dictate the trajectory of the Palestinian people as well the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as it wish, as it was able to do up until now. Ending Hamas rule in Gaza Strip, or to be more accurate, to say making Hamas, limiting Hamas abilities substantially to continue and to play a destructive role, to continue and to be a, a player that dictates the agenda. Achieving that goal is, is not only an Israeli interest. It's a Palestinian interest. Because as we saw in the end of the day, Hamas way in the end of the day, dragged Palestinians into havoc, death and destruction. But it's not only the Palestinians' interest, it's a regional interest. Major Arab players like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, they will shed no tear to see Hamas, Hamas crushed. Hamas presents a threat to those states, not less than Israel. Remember what we said about Hamas ideology, the caliphate, refusal to acknowledge the concept of national statehood. Its, election, its connection to the Muslim Brotherhood, a movement that is defined by Egypt and Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, Emirates as a terror organization, a movement that is all constantly under a massive oppression in Jordan, because it presents ideologically and politically challenged to those monarchies, to those regimes, to those governments. And if Hamas can continue and dictate its radical way, it means lots of challenges and headaches for those regimes internally. So now you can understand why do they have interest also to limit as much as possible Hamas' ability to continue and dictate its radical um, uh, path and trajectory. Many people are talking about the day after. It's totally vague, but I think there is one thing that has to be very clear. The whole story of Gaza Street post the war must be totally different in the sense that there must be a, a kind of like regional frame bringing together major players in the region who has interest in stability. And they have to kind of like form what I call the a scaffolding. That based upon those scaffoldings, we could start and reshaping a different path for Gaza Strip. Because the continuation of Hamas rule in Gaza Strip as it was up until now, the meaning of that is one and only one. Further escalation, further violence, more deterioration, more misery, more death, more destruction. And so there is a need to bring these regional players together to form and to apply a policy, a modus operandi, a practical programs on the ground, not only to rehabilitate Gaza Strip, not only, of course, to offer a different path and future to the Gaza people, but not less important to make sure that Hamas and Islamic Jihad will not be able to continue to play their destructive role. The day after is not Israel's challenge alone, not at all. The day after is a regional challenge. It's an international challenge. And it has to be viewed that way. And we are looking at a very long-term process. And one last, I would say, insight or observation. Um, once again, um, this war indicates very clearly the whole situation, the significant threat that the Iranian Mullah regime presents to the region. Um, the Arab world, many people in the Arab world are saying openly, our major challenge of the Arabs is not really Israel, it's the Iranian regime, because the Iranian regime spread death and destruction and havoc across the Arab world. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the Arab world pay the price for the Iranian regime, sophisticated, sinister uh, vision of becoming a regional power in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Gaza Strip. The issue of the Houthis in the Red Sea very clearly illustrates how dangerous could be uh, further expansion of this regime influence regionally and beyond the region. And one last uh, comment, if I may, regarding to an aspect that goes beyond the region. 
uh, one of the most disturbing scenes that we saw um, in the context of the Western societies, political and academic and intellectual circles uh, following the October 7th uh, attack was um, the fact that quite disturbingly, there are some circles in the West. Uh, I'm not talking about Muslims or Arabs in the West, but I'm talking about Western circles. Some of them are coming from the heart of the um, uh, academia and intellectual circles who uh, basically express support to Hamas. Uh, taking Hamas side and um, to a large extent obviously this is a very disturbing phenomenon we, we all remember the very disturbing hearing uh, of major presidents of major Ivy League uh, universities um, and, 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 and the outcome of that uh, hearing um, uh, one of the things that I think has to be addressed when we talk about this disturbing phenomenon is the is I think that uh, the understanding that it, it it that phenomenon did not grow in a in a vacuum it 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 not appeared from nowhere it's basically one of the outcome of a very challenging process that took place in the world and this is the flattening of the educational process um uh, unfortunately and I think today more than ever it's quite clear uh, that, that the whole major blocks of education, a, a real significant, meaningful education, meaning uh, providing data and, and facts and, and, and context and nuanced understanding of complex reality and sequence of events, all those blocks were basically, unfortunately, uh, pushed aside in the last couple of decades. They were basically replaced by uh, a narrative-based uh, slogan, uh, buzzwords um, and theories and concepts that sounds very compelling and very attractive but really offer no ability to understand the complex reality. So I think that one of the things that we can say following October 7 and those phenomena is the very clear need um, and I can say that based upon my many encounters in the States with different audiences the very deep need and thirst for a real education of understanding a complex situation. That is definitely one of the major challenges that has to be uh, now addressed effectively um, uh, because in the end of the day, we are looking at a very toxic process that has a very severe ramifications, not only in the context of understanding reality and navigating successfully reality, but also in the context of harming um, the fabric of society, a process that I'm afraid, unfortunately, is already taking place. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude my uh, presentation and open this session to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Avi, for your excellent presentation. Um, I will, we have a few questions or several questions, and I'll just start start reading them. Um, the first one is, can you talk about the conditions in Gaza prior to October 7 and how Israel contributed or negated those conditions? There's a current narrative that frames Israel as the oppressors and the Palestinians as the oppressed. But as you know, it's not that simple. Can you elaborate or comment on this? Yes, thank you. Um, indeed, uh, the key word here is narrative, and many times the narrative and reality are quite different. That applies as well as the regarding the story of Gaza Strip. I know that the common narrative regarding Gaza Strip before the war was one presenting Gaza Strip as a place that was presented as an open jail, um, constant humanitarian crisis, people who are allegedly dying because there is no water, there is no food, there is no medicine. Uh, all those narratives were totally baseless. In fact, um, when you look, and there is a lot of documentation made by people from Gaza Street, at the reality in Gaza Street before the war, uh, it may surprise you to know, but in Gaza Street there were hotels, sport resorts, fancy restaurants, uh, new cars, uh, plenty of commodities, uh, hospitals, many hospitals operating in Gaza Strip, 
In other words, the reality in Gaza Strip was very much different from the narratives that have been portrayed in Western discussion. Um, so this is one aspect. The other aspect is, I do need to re-emphasize what I said before. Uh, Hamas ruled Gaza Strip since 2007. This is the government of Gaza Strip. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Hamas has military power, it has 50,000 officials, it legislates laws, it charges taxes, it sets the agenda and curriculum in schools and, in, and, 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 and universities. In any terms and perspective, Hamas is the government in Gaza Strip. However, this is very exceptional and interesting government because this is the only, to the best of my knowledge, the only government in the world that not only exempts itself from any responsibility for the citizens it governs, but more than that, Hamas openly says, it is our interest that the people of Gaza will suffer. Um, I'm saying that so decisively because I'm quoting Hamas people. A um, couple of weeks ago, uh, following the, the war, there has been an outcry in the Arab world, among other things, on Hamas, basically saying to Hamas, you dug this huge network of tunnels, but you didn't think of providing the people of Gaza with shelters, even one shelter. And there was an interesting interview with a major Hamas leader, Musa Abu Marzouk, um, and he was asked that tough question, and his answer was eye-opening answer. He said, those tunnels are not for the people of Gaza. Those tunnels are supposed to protect Hamas. And the other thing that he said, which is very significant to understand the mindset, the other thing he said, he said, Hamas is not responsible for the people of Gaza. The people of Gaza is the concern of the international community. This is very significant to understand because it's totally the antithesis of everything that we in the West think when we think about governmental responsibility. So for us as Western affiliated thinkers, obviously when you have a government, the government is responsible for your well-being in every possible aspect. That is not the mindset of Hamas, and that is something that has to be understood. So I think that it's enormously significant to understand that mindset, particularly in the context of the way Hamas is portrayed in the Western discussion. Thank you. The next question is, these war games have flowed over into the Western world in a seemingly powerful, if not loud, defense of the poor Gazans. The Arab world that you say is critical of Hamas, why are they publicly condemning Israel? There are a couple of reasons for that. First, the most significant one, we have to understand that in the end of the day, the story of the Palestinians, the Palestinian cause and so on, is something that is very much present in the public realm in the Arab world, in all levels. And um, naturally and understandably, the Arabs who are brothers of the Palestinians in terms of ethnicity, the Arabs in terms of religion, most of them, like most of the Palestinians are Muslims, obviously side with the Palestinians emotionally and, 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 and it's very, and politically and culturally, it's very, it's very natural. So this is, this is one level. The other level is that, um, and I was referring to that when I was talking about the concern of major Arab states with the potential of Hamas and Islamic movement, like the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, to, to create an, going, an ongoing unrest within those states, meaning public protests, uh, criticism of the governments because they are not supporting Hamas by their own people, meaning like the Egyptians or the Saudis or the Emirates. Uh, just for as an example, today there has been a um, a demonstration of of Egyptian uh, journalists that basically criticizes the Egyptian government for not taking more proactive to help the people of Gaza Strip. So from both political perspective as practical perspective, the government and rulers of the Arab world has a good reasons not to 
why to basically come forward and stand by the Palestinians, even though, again, I have to say that they are basically emphasizing that they are standing by the Palestinians, um, not necessarily Hamas. And, um, and this is something that is, is, is clearly, um, is clearly um, uh, out there. And then there is another thing that we have to think about when we are talking about the Arab world. And in the back rooms, this is very significant to understand, as I said before, the Saudis, the Egyptians, the Emirates, the Jordanians will not shed a tear to see Hamas crushed. But this is something that is done in the back room. In the official level, in the front level, you will see, you will hear and sound, you will hear those statements and positions of the Arab leaders, the governments. But again, they will try to differentiate between Hamas and the people of the Palestinian people of, of Gaza Strip. Thank you very much. The next question is what is the status of the IDF objective to neutralize tunnel systems by various means, including I, the idea of flooding these spaces? Well, to the best of my knowledge, the issue of flooding these tunnels, there has been reports about some tests that the IDF was doing and then reportedly they were successfully uh, conducted to flood tunnels with uh, seawater. I don't know and I don't have an additional information regarding that aspect. I don't know to say if it has been applied in multiply places or maybe in one place. I don't know to say that. I don't know to say to what extent it is successful or not, because interesting enough, there was reports about it. And then for then since then, there basically has been kind of a like sort of muteness vis-a-vis -vis that issue. I know that Israel is detonating uh, those tunnels. There is documentation of the detonation, uh, the detonating of those tunnels. I think this is, to the best of my knowledge, this is the major a method used by Israel to to eliminate uh, the the tunnels of uh, of Hamas. Okay, thank you. We have a lot of questions, but I think we only have time for one more. So I'm going to um, pull this one, which um, I think is very relevant. What can we do from here to support Israel and the Israeli people? In so many ways, the immediate world around us is just moving on, but Israel is still fighting for its ex its existence. I think that the most significant thing is really to emphasize the importance of the education and the understanding of the complexity of the situation. Um, I think that um, proactively um, presenting to whatever circles of influence that you relate to, it may be in your own family sitting around the table and Shabbat discussion, it may be people that you are engaging in discussion. I think that it's very significant to, to bring the educational component, the I hope that the presentation that I was doing this this evening helped people to have some more of like knowledge and understanding and the ability to basically have a more constructive discussion with people. Um, because remember, yes, there are people who are totally blindside when it comes to understanding. Um, these people, whatever you're going to say, they're not going to change their minds. But there are many, many people who are kind of like neutral, sort of speaking. They're kind of like caught in the middle. They don't really know um, where they stand vis-a-vis -vis this whole story. And for those people, this element of the knowledge, the context, the education, the nuance understanding, as I was hoping I was able to deliver this evening, it's very significant. It is very significant. Um, it's very significant for two major reasons, because it's not only could be constructive helping Israel in its struggle in a very complex reality, but it's also, I think, not less significant in the context of the current atmosphere in the United States, and particularly in the context of American Jewry. Um, I just concluded the a very intense tour in the States in December. I will be back in the States in about a couple of weeks to another tour. Um, I had many meetings, many sessions, many briefings with American Jewry communities. And the two major clear uh, uh, 
themes of that tour, which was very unmistakable to, to, to take with me, was first the, the thirst, the real need of people in understanding of complex reality and the nuance, the context, and so on and so on. This was one thing. And the other thing I would say that there is a sense of urgency. There is a sense of time of crisis for American Jewry. And many people that I met, uh, good friends of mine, and in private discussions, in open sessions that I had, in public uh, appearance that I had, that notion came time and time again. It was very clearly expressed. And it's very understandable given to the, uh, the challenges and the atmosphere that we, we are familiar with today. And I think, again, that further emphasizes the importance of the education. It further emphasizes the importance of really understanding in a better way, in a more profound, in a more, um, you know, I would say intelligent way, a complex reality that has many, many layers, that has many, many dimensions. I think this is the major tool, if I would may say, that people in the States uh, could kind of like really contribute both in the context of the state of Israel and not less in the context of American Jewry themselves. Well, thank you so very much, Avi Malamed, for your presentation. Um, I want to thank all of you for tuning in midday here in the United States. Um, a recording will be available for um, anyone who missed it, so I will be sending that out. And I just want to say, you know, there's so much news coming our way, and it's so easy to feel overwhelmed and confused. So thank you so much for educating us with your clear, objective, and thoughtful presentation. Um, it's so important for us to keep seeking out validated information, and the JCC is really committed to doing that for our community. Um, so again, thank you, Avi, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today. I want to thank the JCC Association for supporting this event, and just know that our hearts and prayers are with you and the Israeli people. Um, so be well, and I hope we can talk again soon someday. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Shalom from Israel. Shalom. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Take care.